Can everyone hear my voice okay, or do I need to put on a headset? You're good. All right. You sound very well. So, so my disclosures, some of which are pertinent. Uh, so this is what I want to cover today. Uh, when do we use it? Uh, how do we do, what are the biomechanics, some technique pearls, and then comparison of conventional LAX screws to S2AI and then concomitant S, S, uh, SI joint fusion. Of note is that Bob now showed you how to do this, and I'm going to tell you why you should do it. So if you only get one summary article with the best pictures for techniques, this article by Heiko Kohler and his group uh, really has some very nice illustrations. So this is a nice reference if you want to go back and look at how to place any of these particular screws. So what are the problems with uh, fusing to the pelvis? Well, pseudarthrosis, rod and screw failure, screw loosening, and then uh, residual pelvic obliquity. So what's the anatomy that we're trying to optimize? So in the sacrum itself, the sacral ala has horrible bone density in this region. The best bone is in the S1 body and in the S1 end plate. The ilium, as you've seen, has multiple long paths and trajectories for bone uh, uh, that gives you good screw purchase. All right, so when we, uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so what we're trying to do with S1 screws to optimize them, we want them medially convergent. Uh, 30 degree screw to screw angle gives us the best rotational stability. Medially convergent is better than laterally divergent. Tricortical is better than bicortical. And in plate purchase is better than parallel to the end plate. So this is the original concept of the medial convergent versus the laterally divergent. And then the uh, promontory fixation, when Ron Lehman was a resident at Walter Reed, this was actually his first spine study. And that uh, I got him to do an insertional torque study comparing going into the sacral promontory versus parallel to the end plate. And it doubles the insertional torque compared to a conventional parallel to the end plate. Iliac fixation has gone through a significant evolution. Starting with the Galveston technique and learning to bend those rods used to be the sign of fellow, uh, a, a fellow who was ready to complete their fellowship. So as we see here, then we went to conventional iliac screws, stacked iliac, divergent iliacs, uh, S2AI, stacked S2AI, and now S2AI along with SI joint fusion. If you only get one biomechanical paper to study about the biomechanics of lumbosacral fixation. This one by McCord and Cunningham is the best paper. And it talks about the pivot point here at the L5-S1 disc space. Anything that extends anterior to that pivot point will have greater resistance to failure. In fact, it will be cantilever loaded rather than inline pullout. And you can see the Galveston and Iliac screw techniques were much better uh, than all of the others. In terms of optimizing iliac screw fixation, uh, one of my partners, Ed Santos, led our work here doing this particular study where we compared two trajectories uh, and diameter and length. And that the bottom line is that the bigger diameter screws do perform better. And that once you get beyond 80 millimeters, you start to hit this sort of what's called second narrow point, uh, which improves the overall purchase of the screw as it goes in. Well, what about the SI joint? Well, when you fuse L5 to S1, you increase the stress on the SI joint by 50%. When you fuse L4 to S1, it goes up by 168%. So we really are increasing the stress on the SI joint. The, the, the modeling did not include if you went more cephalad, but I have gotta think that it's only gonna increase it as well. Conversely, when you fuse the SI joint, you only increase the stress on the lumbar spine two to 4% and on the hip by 5%. So how about non-unions at the lumbosacral junction? Well, the bottom line is the more levels you do, the higher the non-union rate. Uh, this was not a study utilizing uh, RHBMP2 off-label, uh, but it does show the challenge of the longer fusions having a higher non-union rate. So generally, if you're doing more than three levels, there is an argument to be made for pelvic fixation. So S2 ALAR iliac screws first published or presented about 2007 by uh, Paul Sponseller and, and Cal Kabesh. If you look at the uh, PubMed today, you'll find more than 100 papers on this topic. Two that I'd like to point out are finite element models that look at where is the screw strain maximized either by conventional iliac fixation techniques or S2 AIs. So in the conventional techniques, the offset connectors experience profound screw loading 
and then just below the neck of the uh, tulip. Whereas the S2AIs, it's more where it crosses the SI joint and then right here at the top of the screw as well. And then a subsequent study uh, modeled in a similar fashion and got very similar results. And they showed that the favored angled screws seem to perform better. And we'll come back to that favored angle issue in a minute. So a comparative analysis uh, between S2 ALR iliac screws and iliac screws uh, from the published literature shows that in all categories, the S2 ALR iliac screws did better than the iliac screws. And that included all modes of failures for adult and pediatric patients, um, as well as revision rates. And the failure mechanisms were implant failure, screw breakage, screw prominence, and infection. So we, we know about conventional iliac screws being prominent right underneath the skin. And anybody who's ever looked at follow-up in your ambulatory patients has seen this concept of haloing about screws. So what about traditional iliac screws with lateral uh, connectors? The advantage is the bone channel is great. It's uh, pretty safe to put freehand screws in there and you can put very large screws in. Disadvantage is the dissection. The, the fiddle around time with the connectors always adds to the length of the case and prominence is always a challenge. My revision rate for my own iliac screws before I converted over was probably about 35%. And sometimes that was just a removal, but it was still a revision. So uh, there've been several folks who've advocated a modification of the traditional iliac screw. And that's what Bob Hart talked to us about coming a little bit underneath the crest and then uh, recessing the screw. And I think that uh, obviates some of the problems. Uh, it's still, can be a little bit more fiddly in terms of the dissection, uh, but perhaps better than, than the original way. Multiple iliac screws certainly can be done. Uh, you want to start as low in the teardrop as you can to place the most caudal screw. And if you place it just above the sciatic notch, that's probably the most dense bone in the body. And so it gives it the greatest resistance to that cantilever loading. And then the next screw, you've got room all the way up to the iliopectineal line. And then you can even do the additional kickstand rods as was mentioned earlier. So here's an example of stacked S2AI screws. And you see they lined up nicely. And nowadays with the quad rod constructs, what we do is leave the caudal one more medial and the cephalad one uh, more lateral. And then that helps uh, with the screw lineup as well. Uh, here is, so I navigate uh, these screws and we put them in under power. Uh, I broke uh, probably eight or 10 screwdrivers, putting them in by hand and under tapping. So we do tap to the nominal diameter and we wanna stay right above the sciatic notch with the, with the uh, most caudal screw. And so this is what the uh, 2D imaging looks like intraoperatively. And then the teardrop view is showing the screws nicely contained. And that uh, we can in fact use a kickstand rod when you've got this pelvic obliquity and we need to get a force to push the spine more aggressively over that way. You can either push on the screws or on, uh, on ribs uh, as a provisional correction maneuver, or you can use it as a refinement uh, later on in your strategy. How about uh, complications for S2 AI screws? Well, we're just seeing these out long enough now to start to get a sense of this. And this paper was literally published about a week or two ago uh, from uh, Korea showing a failure rate of, uh, of the S2AI screws based on these different mechanisms, which actually correspond very nicely to the finite element models. And so they found about a 3% rate of uh, challenge in their patients requiring revision. So their failure modes included rod breakage, set plug dislodgement, screw breakage, and you see right at the neck going into the tulip, and then where it crosses the SI joint, the purchase in the bone here is really strong, and so you're constantly loading that, and so that has the potential to break. And they have done the most, the most perfect finite element analysis to explain this that I have yet seen. And so when we focus in on the favored angled screw, so now if we got a 30 degree angulation on the screw, what we see is concentration of the extrusion forces on the set plug here. And that is why they're kicking out and then the rods pulling out. So we reviewed our experience in Minnesota. We saw some, some failures of the rods slipping out. We didn't understand what was going on. So we did a case match series in time. We had six cases where we'd had uh, catastrophic failures, so 5% of our cases. And what we found was that was the patients where we were correcting their lumbar lordosis the most that had uh, the biggest risk factor. And while it didn't quite reach uh, statistical significance, 
a transitional segment or a transitional vertebra was had a very high odds ratio. And so we think that that's a significant uh, issue as well. And we don't think it's a particular manufacturer. So our institution uses two different manufacturers and our rate was the same among the two manufacturers. So here's an example of a catastrophic failure afterwards and the set plugs have popped out and you can see them floating in the soft tissues and then the rods have pulled out and the, we've lost the correction. And in this patient, you see a fracture occurred through the transitional S1, S2 segment, even though it looked like this person wouldn't have much motion there. And then a, a paper that I had the opportunity to collaborate with my colleagues from Mayo Clinic on, uh, Ben Elder started looking at supine versus upright pelvic incidence. And I suggested to him, well, look to see if there is a vacuum sign uh, on the CT scan. And if they have a bilateral vacuum sign, what that tells us is there's greater mobility or change from the supine to the upright pelvic incidence, indicating motion through the SI joint. So to me, uh, a bilateral vacuum sign on CT scan is concerned that the person is going to have a mobile SI joint. Now, what about development of new SI pain after pelvic fixation? Well, some folks have told me, well, it never happens. Well, I don't know that we've been good about looking for it. And if you never look for something, you'll certainly never see it. Unoki in a, a wonderful paper out of Japan showed that the incidence is dependent upon the length of the fusion and the more, more segments that are fused, the higher the rate that they saw in their patients. Well, what can we do about this? Well, biomechanically, we know that if we do a concomitant SI joint fusion, typically with a triangular titanium rod, that we can markedly decrease the bending moments experienced by the screws uh, by almost 50%. And that if we look at range of motion in cadaveric testing, it's decreased by about 30%. Not a large angular change, but a percentage reduction that is pretty significant. And what about uh, finite element modeling? Same kind of concept the range of motion is significantly decreased percentage-wise, even though the range of motion is not particularly high, and it does decrease the screw strain in your S1 screws as well. Uh, and so uh, looking at our uh, intraoperative imaging, so it's like your stacked uh, iliac screws. Again, you want to put the uh, most caudal screw just above the sciatic notch, and then in a similar fashion, putting a flat side of the triangular titanium rod paralleling the screw, you can also go in a similar path. We do this with navigation. Again, the first screw, we want to stay as low in the teardrop as possible. And then the triangular titanium rod sort of nests in the top of the teardrop, which probably helps provide additional stability as well. So here are some intraoperative images. So we place our screws with navigation and then uh, out of habit, we check them as well. And so this is uh, what our intraoperative imaging looks like on both sides showing us that we've got the implant in place and it's well contained within the bone. And I've had some folks say, well, you don't catch much of the sacrum. Well, actually we're catching, these are 90 millimeter implants. So we're catching 40, 45 millimeters of sacrum there. And uh, it can be done in people who've had prior SI fusion. So this person uh, who was referred to me from somewhere else uh, uh, really probably had a thoracolumbar shoramens as her initiating problem. Uh, had an SI fusion that didn't really resolve her issues. And so we were able to remove these implants and uh, do this salvage uh, reconstruction all in one sitting. So what about the data? So we don't have a lot of data yet on this technique. We do have a multi-center randomized controlled trial that is ongoing that is re registered at clinicaltrials.gov. And so uh, my initial case series, we reported uh, 21 patients, 19 of which I was uh, uh, the surgeon on. And so these were our first uh, uh, patients utilizing this technique. Our typical screws are 9500 uh, in the S2AI screws. And then our uh, triangular titanium rods, most common 70 by 90. That's the longest that's currently manufactured. One or two of them we had to uh, shorten up a little bit. And in the initial experience, three of them were malpositioned and that we were able to identify that intraoperatively and repositional. Not had any subsequent to that, and, uh, and we've done, I've done four more cases since that time. And we've also got video data on some of these cases as part of another study. So our average time to put in our S2AI screws about three and a half minutes. And for our triangular titanium rods, it was about eight and a half minutes, but one of, 
one of those was an outlier that we had to salvage. And so that uh, um, I think the times are relatively similar between the screws and the rods. And uh, I like to to show uh, what goes, what can go wrong. So this individual had a BMI of uh, 46.5 and uh, we couldn't see on 2D imaging uh, what was going on well. And it felt like one of the implants went out to me. And so we, on the check spin, we could see that it was in fact out uh, and bridged medially, which is the way that it will usually go uh, awry and that we were able to successfully reposition that. And that patient is now more than six months out and doing well from his pelvic fixation. This does not obviate PJK or the other problems of adult deformity, but it may give us a more solid foundation to work from. That's not the only issue that we deal with around the pelvis. So this 94 year old uh, lady came in to see me uh, or actually was admitted to our hospital and my colleagues said, well, she should just be treated with bed rest and she had bowel bladder incontinence. I said, well, I'm not sure that that's the best answer. And so I do like the Schildauer technique that came out of Harborview uh, for fixing this kind of a strategy uh, with uh, a spinal pelvic fixation and then using the through and through iliosacral screws to buttress this uh, to help hold the, the sacrum in place. I have not figured out yet how to resolve this S1, S2 angular uh, malformation. And so she is left with uh, residual pelvic incidence, lumbar lordosis mismatch, because she has changed her pelvic incidence uh, by increasing it through the fracture. So in summary, uh, we want to optimize our S1 screws, and I prefer to go tricortical. If we're going to go more than three levels, I will typically use iliac fixation. If I'm going to use iliac screws, I want them to be longer than 80 millimeters and at least eight millimeters in diameter. And Kabesh has reported that that decreases the failure rate. Uh, S2AI seems to have a lower revision rate than conventional iliac screws. Stack screws are possible. Uh, start low with your most caudal one, uh, as low in the teardrop as you can go. And perhaps there may be a role going forward for concomitant SI fusion. Happy to take questions. Uh, Dave, uh, Bob Banco here. Does everybody need bilateral fixation? Yeah, so that's a good question. And, and the answer is, I think so. If, if you're going to do it, it makes sense to me to do both sides. Uh, because the stress on the SI joint, if you just do unilateral fixation, you're going to uh, concentrate that stress on the contralateral side. Uh, I don't have data to support that. That's only opinion. Uh, but that's my considered opinion on that topic. And that was my follow-up question. Are there any papers that address that issue of contralateral SI pain? Well, so what I can tell you is in the primary SI space, there is literature that says that if you do a unilateral fusion, you do not affect the behavior of the contralateral side. Thank you. I think that's a great presentation. Very comprehensive, David. Um, one David, question. Can I ask a question? Oh. Yeah, please, Ted, go. Uh, David, uh, <clears throat> at Harborview right now, there is a interest in looking at the clinical outcome of uh, using just sacral screws versus lumbosacral uh, fixation. And since you quoted it today, I'm asking if you would be interested in, uh, in joining with that effort to look at the clinical outcome. Sure, ha happy to. Uh, um... And, uh, and it, you know, I think we, we all have uh, what I would call confirmation bias, that it, our last failure uh, causes us to change what we do. And that uh, um, I had done a number of minimally invasive, uh, so open a lips at 4551 and then lateral interbodies with posterior perk screws. Delighted with how quickly the patients got out of the hospital. I had three in a row that went on to non-unions at L5S1. And so uh, even with an ALIF and a good cross-sectional area ALIF, for these patients who I was correcting both coronal and sagittal plane deformity, they just didn't go on to, it wasn't stable enough for them. And so that was my bias is to say, uh, okay, O for three is enough for me uh, to say, I'm going to change the way I swing at that pitch. 
Yeah, I uh, so uh, I uh, was going to come at um, I thought that was a, that's a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, the uh, one thing I would add, and I, I have a very similar approach. If I need to fuse L2 to the sacrum, um, I'm routinely adding pelvic fixation, and a lot of times, if it's L3 to the sacrum, I do. Um, and and my thinking is not only the biomechanics of getting that to heal but also sort of creating a modular construct that I don't have to revisit uh, if they wear out. And, and I don't know what the duration of, uh, you know, the durability of a, a, you know, L3 to pelvis or an L2 to pelvis. I think most of us expect that within 10 years uh, at the most, we'll probably be back and revising that uh, patient. Um, and so I'd ask for your comment on that idea. And the, the, the second one is I am, um, uh, I have done some with unilateral pelvic fixation, and they would all be those shorter constructs. Uh, but I just saw, I'm beginning to see now patients that are wearing out their SI joints below, below long constructs of my own, you know, my own patients. Uh, and it seems to be five, one of them was 13 years out. Uh, but not only, so I, I think we place pel pelvic fixation not only to get a higher fusion rate, but also to prevent longer term complications of sacroiliac, not just sacroiliac DJD, not that in fact, but, uh, but sacral fracture. Uh, and I just saw one woman that I'd operated on 13 years ago that was a T10 to S1 and at that time did not use iliac fixation. And she got a solid fusion of L5 S1. I know that because I had seen a CT scan showing it. And she came back to my uh, clinic now with a fracture, not only through the sacrum, but through her graft at L5-S1. And it had an allograft ring had fractured, and uh, so we needed to revise her for that this past week. So I don't know if, I, th I think the forces there are huge, and without pelvic fixation, they really are susceptible as, as time passes. Yeah, so, so getting a good foundation for your work, either current or subsequent, is always a good idea. And there was one good question in the chat box from uh, Pat McNulty. He said, does S2AI, putting in an S2AI screw, does that obviate the issue of uh, sacroiliac joint pain? And at least according to the data from Japan, it does not. Um, what is uh, the current question is, do two S2AI screws uh, obviate that? And I don't know. I think with a single S2AI screw, what you do is change the instantaneous axis of rotation of the SI joint. And so you're altering how it's loaded a little bit. Uh, and with the stack screws, I think you probably uh, stop that rotation, uh, but I don't know if it obviates pain. And so that's why we're doing the study with the triangular titanium rods to see if that does it. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, I think it's a very hot topic right now and there's lots of opinion and uh, uh, some biomechanical data, but emerging clinical effort to try to understand it a little better. Yeah, fantastic uh, presentation and discussion. I, I apologize, I didn't get a chance to uh, introduce you, so I'll, uh, I'll uh, introduce you at, uh, as we exit your conversation. So Dr. Polly is a professor and chief of spine surgery at University of Minnesota, uh, where he holds the James Ogilvie uh, Chair and uh, Catherine Mills Davis Land Grant Chair in Biomechanical in Engineering. Uh, he completed his training at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and his fellowship at the uh, University of Minnesota Department of Orthopedic Surgery. So, David, thank you. It's just an absolute honor to have you here as one of our faculty. <laughs>